Hello, everybody, and welcome to the AEW Dynamite Review Show here on the unofficial WWE podcast. We've got a whole lot to talk about here from AEW's inability to follow up with the women's division, a TNT championship match, and guess what, guys? Sting is on AEW. So we've got all that and so much more. Let's jump right into it. Championship needs that much. I can't believe what we're seeing here. D M D. All right, you guys, today is March 25th, 2021, and we are talking about last night's AEW Dynamite show. Um, there was some good, some bad, and we're going to get into it all. But uh, first and foremost, as you guys heard, did a, did a quick new intro. I just wasn't a fan of the original one I did. Just started to whatever the opposite of grow on me is. I don't know. It started to shrink on me. I, I don't know. But yeah, so um, I hope you guys like that. Love to always hear your thoughts on that. And we do have an email or two, if I remember correctly, that we will also get into. But um, first and foremost, I want to welcome you guys to the unofficial WWE podcast and um, specifically the AEW Dynamite Review Show. Thank you for listening. Um, we're happy to have you here and uh, appreciate it uh, every single time. It means I get to keep doing this and, and I love talking wrestling with you guys. So thanks for being here and uh, thanks for taking time out of your day to include me in it. So we're going to go down the card as we normally do and we're going to start with the top of the show. That was an AEW Championship Eliminator match. Uh, if Matt Seidel beat or pinned... Um, Kenny Omega, he would get a AEW World Heavyweight Championship match. Uh, we kind of predicted how this match was going to go, but it was still exciting nonetheless, so let me give you guys a quick recap. But before I forget to mention, I think I've said this before, but I mean, how great is Kenny Omega's entrance? It is just so obnoxious and so arrogant and so self-indulgent. The intro and the entrance and the girls with the brooms and the whole, the whole ordeal, it is just... Like, chef's kiss, perfect for Kenny Omega and um, and his character. So, love that. Just always pop for that. Always. In, but, like, pop, but also pop in the annoying way. Like, I get it. There, it, it is doing its job very well. Kenny Omega is playing a great heel, and it's annoying that he does this whole thing every single time. And his introduction is about, you know, two minutes long. Uh, I think it was Tony Schiavone that had a great line uh, as he was coming down to the ring saying something like, well, we can throw away our notes on Kenny Omega now. And then Excalibur said something like, uh, wait, are we allowed to talk during his entrance? Just brilliant every single time. And uh, and like I said, and I won't talk about Kenny Omega's entrance anymore. We will get into the recap of this match, but I do appreciate that. I want to make sure I make that known. Uh, great, great aspect to the Kenny Omega character as a whole. So, the recap to this match, uh, Omega starts with control in the match, keeps it kind of slow and steady, and Seidel tries to pick up the pace, obviously. They go back and forth for a little while until Seidel attempts a top rope her Karana, but I've n I don't think I've ever seen this counter before. Omega counters, dropping Seidel um, down hard below the turnbuckle, and honestly, I don't know about you guys, I had like flashbacks to, I think it was Double or Nothing at the Casino Battle Royale when Seidel made his debut in AEW and he was like the surprise entrant to the uh, battle royale and he injured himself that night uh I think it was the same turnbuckle too it just I don't know I had I had quick flashbacks because I am a Ma uh, Matt Seidel fan I was a giant Evan Bourne fan as a little girl which is kind of weird to say but yeah no I loved Evan Bourne in the terrible version of ECW and so uh it's super cool to see my Matt Seidel doing so well I mean he's he's won about seven out of his eight last Last singles competitions, I think JR said. But anyways, um, Omega hits a Snapdragon suplex. But Seidel sneaks in a lightning spiral uh, for a close two count. Matt Seidel attempts the Meteora, but Kenny uh, counters with the V-triggers, or two V-triggers. And then later on, Seidel goes for the Shooting Star Press, but uh, is supposedly off balance. And so Omega... Pulls on the rope, hits another V-trigger, and then the one-winged angel and the champ pin.
pins Matt Seidel for a three count. Kind of how we expected this match to go, but nevertheless, I thought it was a great match. It was snug. Um, some of the spots were really well done. Nothing too exciting, nothing too exhilarating, and kind of nothing too surprising. Just a quick uh, match. Not quick, I guess, but uh, on the it didn't go too long. I think if this match had gone any minute longer, I would I would be sitting on this podcast complaining about it. But quick, nice match to open the show, and uh, and yeah, I mean, I don't really have much more to say about it. Two guys, great competitors. I feel like these two guys, if they really wanted to, could put on like you know four and a half star match, but this just wasn't it. You know, nothing too exhilarating, like I said. I don't know if I'd call this all elite, but it was definitely entertaining. And yeah, and that was the opening match to AEW tonight. And then we move on to the backstage interview with the Dark Order. So Alex Marvez asked John Silver if he's ready for his match. And the Dark Order all say, let's show him how ready he is. And then they all start doing little trust falls and have um, John Silver dodging them, you know, uh, imitating, countering the coffin drop, obviously. And then Hangman Page comes in and asks if he's nervous. John says, I'm not nervous. Uh, Hangman says, uh, it's a big opportunity. Don't worry. Those guys will be proud of you either way. And yeah, then, then we move on into the Hangman Adam Page match. Nothing, again, too much to talk about about this segment. Just cute. Love John Silver. Love the Dark Order. Just belovable. Belovable. That's not a word. Beloved. Lovable. Let's go with that. Uh, guys. And cute cute little interview and then like i said we go on to the uh hangman adam page versus uh cesar bononi match but don't you guys worry because in between right on commentary we hear sting will be here no matter what and sting will be watching in the uh, will be watching the match in the back and sting will be doing this and sting is taking up crap in the bathroom outside and sting is in catering and sting has just arrived at the building and sting and sting and sting and i don't care stop telling me about sting 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 we're talking about a tnt championship match between john silver and darby allen two young talented guys i think they're both only in their 20s or something like that stop telling me about sting i don't care about sting i mean god if i drank this would be a perfect drinking game drink every time they say sting or mention where sting's whereabouts are or what sting's doing you would be drunk by the first hour of the show guys this is getting to be too much for me and i will probably rant more about it later on in the show so let's move on to this match between hangman adam page and cesar bononi not a lot to talk about this match but i did love um jr had a quick line he says that uh he's the foster child of the dark order hangman i like that i think that was a cute cute just a cute line and um And yeah, so I mean, the only thing I really got out of this match, and there's not much to recap for you guys, but Paige is is deceptively strong. He doesn't look like a big muscly guy, but some of the stuff he was doing to Cesar um, in this match was, again, he just is deceptively strong. Uh, I love the buckshot lariat, and that leads me into telling you guys that the end of this match, you know, uh, Hangman Adam Page hits the buckshot lariat for the 1-2-3, and yeah, this was just another victory uh, to put under the belt of Hangman Adam Page and uh, just to continue to get him some face time on Dynamite because I think, like I, I think I've said before on this podcast, I assume he is our next babyface champion, uh, taking the title away from Kenny Omega eventually. So we get a great rematch between those two. But yeah, just cute little developments with the Dark Order, Hangman Page stuff still. Nothing, again, too much, just kind of like I think last week was the lawnmower thing, or maybe that was two weeks ago, I don't know, it's all blurring together, guys. Uh, But just continuing the storyline, not shoving it down our throat, just quick match, perfect again. I didn't need another minute of this, but I thought this did its job. Again, not not too all elite, there's nothing super exciting yet uh, on AEW, but functional, and I will take functional. Um, And speaking of not too exciting, and I mean, I don't even know if I could call this functional, and speaking of Sting, we have a Lance Archer promo. Um, he's in some warehouse, and he says, Sting, I looked at you. Uh, what do I have? I looked at you. I looked up to you, excuse me. Uh, without Sting, there would be no Lance Archer. You want to know why? Uh, I would interrupt your time because it should be my time. I actually agree with that, Lance Archer. Uh, this bat, and he's holding up Sting's bat or whatever, this bat meant people paid attention to you. Uh, well, now they're going to pay attention to me, and if they don't, the walls are going to cave in, or excuse me, the walls are going to come crashing down on them, and it's going to be my boot that kicks 
it in on them. You're going to go down as one of the greatest ever sting and people are going to remember my name the murder hawk monster lance archer and sooner or later it's going to be showtime and the next caliber says he made his intentions clear didn't he and i was like what no he didn't because if my reading sounded bad again guys i'm sorry i'm going blinder by the day so i'm trying to read my notes and it's not going so well but honestly Lance Archer's promo didn't make a lot more sense than me repeating Lance Archer's promo on this uh, podcast. What was this? There was no, it was jumbled, it was disjointed. This made absolutely no sense. So no Excalibur, he did not make his intentions clear. Um, I assume this is leading to some Sting-Lance Archer match, but he didn't even say anything like that. He just complimented Sting and then talked about how he deserves more TV time and something about walls crashing down and his boot and a bat and that it was weird. He he didn't even like insult Sting or come at Sting. He just compliment. I, this whole thing was weird. Am I the only one who just did, none of this made any sense to me? I I didn't get this. Uh, this did not hit. And I guess this kind of comes along with, you know, the guys being able to come up with their own promos. Is sometimes it's not going to hit. And this did not hit. This missed. I, I did not get this or understand where this was coming from. And uh, and I'd love to see a Lance Archer Darby Allen match. I, I don't really need to see a Lance Archer Sting match because I don't really need to see me Sting wrestle again. Uh, the cinematic thing, fine, but whatever. Uh, this this made no sense. I it is unable to be analyzed because it made no sense. So uh, that's the best I can do for you guys. And we can move on to the Doctor Britt Baker Thunder Rosa recap that played next. Uh, I thought it was well done and just again emphasized how wonderful of a baby face Thunder Rosa is and then we had a Dr. Britt Baker interview with Tony Schiavone and I I loved this segment um I mean I'm actually I'm gonna I, I am not gonna do this promo justice but I'm going to try to get across what she was saying to you guys because this was unbelievable um Tony Schiavone yeah says that she needs another round of or she deserves a round of applause for the um the performance she had uh, last week and then Britt Baker's obviously upset with the reception she gets. She's like, that's it. That's that's it. And then she talks about later on in the promo how she doesn't need a reception at all. But whatever. She says, Thunder Rosa, you got to be you got to be part of history that I wrote with my own blood. Great line. Uh, and then you had the audacity to stand in my company in my division and say you put the women on the map. Then why is everybody talking about me? Again, brilliant, Um, and this was one of my favorite parts, too. She says, Mick Foley, thanks for the thumbs up. It took you 20 years to become the hardcore legend, and I did it in one night. Oof, and I think Mick Foley tweeted something back about this, and he was kind of hurt by it. I think he was just trying to encourage these women, but poor Mick Foley, great great guy. But Britt Baker, just a wonderful heel character. I mean, if you want some heat, insult one of the most beloved wrestlers of all time, and that is Mick Foley. Uh, so she continues, she said, and that night when I had 87 thumbtacks, 87 thumbtacks in my back and the blood was flowing down my face, I never saw more clearly another awesome line. Uh, and then she says, Tony Khan, you're out here looking for every legend that ever has been when you have the biggest one right here standing under your nose. Because not only did I make history that night, I put AEW on the map. And AEW comes second behind, you guys heard it in the intro, DMD. Um, Unbelievable promo. Probably my favorite segment of the night. I mean, short and sweet, but that's all I needed from Britt Baker. I think, I mean, I I wouldn't want to see her wrestling after what she went through last week. I know it was taped, but still, right? In in Cafe Bland, it was last week. Uh, I mean, she brings it right back to getting heat on her. She goes after Mick Foley, like I said, one of the most beloved wrestlers of all time. Easy, easy, cheap heat, you know, says, screw all you guys. I don't need your claps or whatever. I know I'm this good. Uh, love the line uh, about the, uh, you know, the blood in my face. I've never seen more clearly. And uh, she's not wrong. I mean, everybody is talking about her and uh, short and sweet, just Great segment, great interview, uh, and put a mic in Britt Baker's hand. Get Britt Baker on TV every week. I mean, she is a proven draw. Uh, I know if I had, you know, friends or whenever I'm watching AEW with my fiancé, like two people I always, you know, tap her and say like, oh, wait, pay attention to this part, MJF and Britt Baker. Uh, 
two awesome draws to this company. Put the title on this woman already. Uh, she is give her a faction. You know, let's build a women's division around Britt Baker. And I mean that. I do sing her praises a lot on this podcast, but I think it is 110% deserved. Um, she carries that women's division on her back. And again, it doesn't matter if Thunder Rosa got the win last week. I mean, I think they both they both won, uh, even Britt Baker in the loss. Um, and so with that being said, this was the most poorly timed interview to follow up uh, that interview. And this one was with Christian Cage. I think there was a commercial break in between, but um, I don't I don't watch it on live cable. So I, I wouldn't know. But, yeah, I think there was a commercial break in between, and this just was bad timing. But um, Christian Cage is backstage with, uh, who was it? He was backstage with the Varsity Blondes and Dante Martin before their match against the Pinnacle. Uh, Dasha comes to interview him, and Christian Cage says that he's giving them some friendly advice uh, because she asks what they're talking about. And then Frankie Kazarian comes uh, comes on shot and interrupts Christian and points out that his shirt says outwork everybody and he's like okay when's the work gonna begin and the rest of us are like we agree Kazarian Christian when when are you gonna wrestle um and uh it's kind of like Sting it's just like Sting promo promo promo. like when were we gonna see Sting in the ring because it was just all this talking um and uh, Christian Cage says that the work starts next week, and he told Kazarian to step up, and Kazarian accepts the challenge, and next week on Dynamite, it'll be Christian Cage versus Frankie Kazarian in Christian Cage's AEW in-ring debut. Uh, I think, you know, at the at the very least, um, this is a good matchup to have. I liked Frankie Kazarian's line about, you know, you're not busy Monday, are you? Of course you're not. Um, that was That was funny. And, yeah, I mean, these guys know each other from their history. I think they were on TNA at the same time. I was not familiar with TNA, but I I do know of that. So good first match for Christian. Yeah, I guess we'll just have to see how it goes. Um, And hopefully, you know, seven years, like uh, Frankie Kazarian said, seven years is a long time. So we'll have to see see how he is in the ring, and hopefully he can back up his T-shirt that says Outwork Everybody. Um, Yeah, just poor timing, though, after you have – Britt Baker saying, Tony Khan, you're out there looking for all the legends when you've got, you know, her right under your nose. Because meanwhile, Christian Cage has got more airtime, it feels like, uh, or is getting airtime, I think, that should be devoted to the women. I I don't know. A lot of people are getting airtime that should be devoted somewhere else on the show, in my opinion. So whatever. Moving on. Uh, I don't mean to pick on Christian. I actually am a big Christian fan, and I am excited for his match next week. And it kind of, you know, he's got a lot of pressure on him. It, it all kind of comes down to that because this was, this is not his fault. I've mentioned before on this podcast that this whole thing is not Christian's fault. Um, the build up that they had, the you know, all of the the hype that AEW wanted around this signing ended up being a. Um, <sighs> harping I guess on uh Christian's debut because if they just maybe left it as a surprise I'm not going to go into this whole thing again but it wouldn't have been this big disappointment because Tony Khan had us all talking about CM Punk or Brock Lesnar or John Cena or yada 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 right all these big names and we got Christian and Christian isn't Christian's great um but he's just not like he's not as big as this whole thing got hyped up to be um in my opinion and apparently in many others so Moving on, we got the Pinnacle match, uh, FTR and Sean Spears versus FTR and Dante Martin. Uh, Good, quick, little match, really, just to put the Pinnacle over, and just just did that, really, um, functional. Um, The match ends with uh, Dax shooting Dante Martin's momentum down with a brain buster, Sean Spears tags in and hits the C4 Death Driver on Martin and gets the 1-2-3. Uh, after the match, Wardlow starts to assault Brian Pillman Jr. of the Varsity Blondes. Um, Tony Schiavone goes into the ring to interview the Pinnacle. Cash Wheeler starts off saying that the Pinnacle is not just a name, it's not just a group. The Pinnacle is a family, and I will live and die for these, uh, live and die for every single one of them. And then Dax says that they're not fooled by the inner circle and uh, emphasizes professional wrestling um, and says that this isn't an SNL skit. And then MJF gets the microphone and says, (laughs) I mean, he is just going at Chris Jericho, this poor guy. 
He says, Chris, I expected you to come here by now and, quote, break the walls down. But I guess the only thing you're breaking nowadays is whatever chair you decide to sit in. Uh, and then he calls out Chris Jericho and the rest of the inner circle and says that they won't come out because they are terrified of the pinnacle. And then poor little Tony Giovanni tries to interrupt them saying, but wait, you guys decimated them two weeks ago, yada, yada, yada. And then MJF says, oh, what did you say? Like trying to, you know, him and Wardlow gets in his face too, trying to intimidate him. And, uh, you know, Tony Schiavone very intelligently shuts up and uh, MJF gives him a little slap on the face. And MJF says that uh, next week, he has a gift for the pinnacle because when you're in the pinnacle, you're always on top. I like that line. Um, and so, yeah, this, I mean, all in all, this segment from the match to the uh, beat down to the promo, I thought did its job. And again, very functional. Not a lot of necessarily, I wouldn't say like elite things on the show, but definitely functional, definitely did its job. Um, MJF, always amazing on the mic. Good to see FTR on the mic as always too. They are not shabby themselves. And, um, and Wardlow, you know, when there was interference on the outside with Tully Blanchard and MJF and Wardlow, and then Wardlow during the uh, the interview, the way he looked at Tony Schiavone, I got, like, real... Oh, and the beatdown of uh, Brian, Brian Pillman. I got, like, real Batista vibes. Like, this is very Evolution-esque, you know? Uh, and I got real Batista vibes from Wardlow, which just makes me more excited to see the eventual Wardlow babyface turn because, I mean, him and MJF are going to go or at least MJF is going to go at him on the mic, and I'm just excited what Wardlow can uh, do in a in a different light, I guess we can say. Yeah, in a different light as a, as a baby face. So all of this great, you know, just functional, moving on, continuing the storyline. I'm excited to see when the inner circle come back, and I'm ready to get some of these matches underway. I want to see FTR versus Santana and Ortiz. I said this before on this podcast, MJF and Chris Jericho, Wardlow and Hager again. Uh, Sammy and MJF is a match I'm really looking forward to, probably even almost more than the MJF Chris Jericho match. So yeah, I mean a bunch of a bunch of really exciting matches to come. I'm just like ready to get to them, but I am glad AEW is taking its time and not rushing into the stuff and continuing the anticipation in this rivalry. I mean, all this stuff is super well done, and I'm also excited to see this group get some gold on them. Uh, I want to see a heel faction holding some gold i know kenny omega and the um, good brothers obviously have the title and the uh, impact tag team titles but i don't know i just i'm ready to see uh i i doubt anybody from the pinnacle is going to take the title away from kenny omega but i would love to see uh ftr win the titles back from the young bucks so so yeah great segment overall i mean this probably second favorite segment on the show maybe i don't know there's a there's a great match we're going to talk about later on but just well done. I, I always love when you put a mic in MJF's hand. You're, you're rarely ever going to go wrong, in my opinion. Um, and so then we move on. We had a Team Taz promo. Uh, nothing too exciting. Essentially, Taz just says that uh, Brian Cage apologized to the whole group, and especially Ricky Starks. And then Cage obviously looks like huffing and puffing over there in the corner, but he rolls his eyes and finally replies, who better than Cage? And um, and yeah, that was pretty much it. Just kind of teasing some more dissension in this group. I think I said last week that I didn't really want them to break up. But, you know, when I think a little bit more about it, I don't know. I, I could be excited for some matches. I mean, Will Hobbs versus Brian Cage, even Ricky Starks versus Brian Cage. You know, this could be something. I just I just don't know. I don't know how good Brian Cage is on the mic, and clearly they have Taz speaking for him for a reason. Maybe he's gotten better in uh, on a promo or on the stick, but we'll see. I just I just worry that Brian Cage is going to get lost in the sauce after this whole thing because, you know, big, meaty, muscly guy just doesn't get you as far as it used to. I mean, look at the TNT champion is the complete opposite of uh, Brian Cage, so... All right, another interview was next, and it was Tony Schiavone interviewing QT Marshall. I mean, Tony Schiavone was on the show more than Sting's been on AEW for the past couple of weeks. I'm really taking shots at poor Sting tonight, guys. I, I promise, I'm really not that down on him. It's just the booking of him constantly, and them. it's like shoving down our throats, man. Anyways, um, Tony Schiavone interviews QT Marshall, and uh, QT says that Cody Rhodes taught him the value of doing work, but uh, essentially that... He's doing all this work, but he's always going to be in the shadow of Cody because he's just Cody's friend. 
Uh, and the only way he's going to step out of Cody's shadow is to have an exhibition next week. Cody Rhodes comes out and says that I'm not going to hurt you, uh, that if I hook on the crossroads, I'm not going to follow through with it. If I apply the figure four, I'm going to let it go. You uh, you might be my best friend, so let's do it. Let's have an ex- exhibition, friend to friend. I, I don't. And then they shake hands, and Cody's, by the way, in a sling, so I don't know how he's going to have a match next week. I, I don't get this whole thing, guys. Again, weird, uh, cool, nightmare families. I don't know. Compared to a lot of the other stuff on the show, this is just uninteresting. I'm I'm not interested in QT Marshall. I think they did their best. He's, like, pointing at his wife. He's kind of trying to relate more, more become more of a human being to us. But it just didn't do anything for me. Um, boring. You know, not not for me. Uh, and I love Cody Rhodes. So I just think, uh, what what happened to this whole Penta thing? That just dropped that, I guess, one match and that was it. One unsatisfying match and then they just moved on. Uh, Cody's moving on to an exhibition with QT Marshall that he's apparently not going to try to win. I don't know. I guess we will have to see how this goes next week. I might be eating my words. Um, but on to something more exciting and the best match of the night probably was the AEW World Tag Team Champions, the Young Bucks. Uh, and Brandon Cutler versus the Lucha Brothers and Laredo Kid. Uh, this was a super exciting match, guys. I'll give you guys a quick little recap of all this because I, I loved watching this. You know, on con- commentary, uh, Tony Schiavone said something like, seems seems like every time Ray Phoenix is in a match, it's a five-star match. And I couldn't agree more. You guys know I praise Ray Phoenix on this show on a weekly basis. Um, but yeah, so uh, this match started off. Uh, with Ray Phoenix and Nick Jackson, um, and then they uh, go at it a little while, and then um, Nick tags in Matt Jackson, and Ray Phoenix tags in Penta. Um, Matt eats a thrust kick from Penta, and then Matt manages to get the sharpshooter on Penta, but uh, he crawls to the bottom rope, forcing the break. Then Cutler and Laredo Kid both get tagged in. Laredo Kid essentially starts this whole awesome, you know, segment of just high spots to the outside uh you have ray phoenix grabs both the bucks and gives them an arm drag sending to the outside penta crashes onto them penta hits sling blades on matt and nick jackson and then the lucha bros hit stereo thrust kicks on the bucks penta uh stomped onto nick jackson with a double foot stomp and ray phoenix uh hits a diving senton uh, nick jackson blocks a cutter from ray phoenix and then hits a running knee Nick blasts Ray Phoenix with a stiff clothesline, and that little, uh, like, five-second back and forth was probably my favorite part of the match. I mean, that the recap, uh, my recap doesn't do it justice. You know, um, this exchange where the, the cutter gets reversed by um, Nick Jackson, and then this awesome knee in the corner, and then the thrust kicks back and forth, and then that weird swinging in the ropes thing. Uh, and into a heel hook that Ray Phoenix does to uh, Nick Jackson, and then, you know, the weird swinging in the ropes thing again, and then the clothesline to Phoenix, just, like, exhilarating, you know, has me on the edge of my seat watching this match, I, and I'm not going to do it any justice. Let me give you guys that little, a little audio of that part, just so you can hear what I'm talking about and, and relive it, because what an awesome little portion of this match. Exchanging those thrust kicks impressively. Ray Phoenix puts on the brakes, comes around with a heel hook. Nick Jackson now turns him inside out. Wow. I mean, just awesome stuff. Really just exhilarating action to watch back and forth. Um, and then you get, again, more exhilarating action. You have Matt Jackson who catches Laredo Kid into two Northern Light suplexes, and then Penta tries to interfere. And then Matt Jackson, after already hitting two Northern Light suplexes, hits Laredo Kid and Penta at the same time with one. Just unbelievable strength and athleticism and stamina. Um, he power bombs Ray Phoenix into the corner turnbuckle and tags in Nick. The Bucks hit a, a risky business, and then Cutler crashes down onto Ray Phoenix after a springboarding up top. Cutler helps his partners with an assisted indie taker in the middle of the melee, but Laredo runs in with a Spanish fly on Cutler to score the pin after both the young Bucks jump to the outside to take out both Penta and Phoenix. The match even ends in this exhilarating way, and to finish this awesome match, you can finish it in no other way than one of the most beautiful moves in professional wrestling, the Spanish Fly. Just awesome stuff, guys. Really fun to watch. Um, 
And then afterwards, we get to Kenny Omega running out and blindsiding uh, Laredo Kid with the microphone on the head. You know, a little homage to the John Moxley match. Uh, Kenny Omega says that he was having vivid flashbacks from Fighter Fest and uh, confronts the Young Bucks saying, Three years ago, I had a choice. Uh, did I choose to stay at home with the fans who loved me? Did I go back to New York? No. Uh, you're thinking I chose AEW. No, I didn't choose AEW. I chose the Young Bucks so we could make this the best wrestling promotion on the planet. And rather than sit with the cool kids at the high school cafeteria, I like that little part, um, you chose Brandon Cutler. Uh, I'm going to give you one more chance. Are you with me? And then uh, he throws up the too sweet thing and says, toss it up for the hard cam. It's now or never. Are you with me? Uh, and then looks at Don Callis, says, you know, I, I may not agree with everything Don Callis says, but you guys have changed. The Bucks do not comply. They walk away with Brandon Cutler, and Kenny, o uh, Kenny Omega says that we're done. So we get a breakup of Kenny Omega and the Young Bucks officially. Obviously, this has been being teased for the last couple of weeks. And then we get the Lucha Brothers attacking Kenny Omega from behind. They lay him out with a um, assisted turnbuckle pile driver thing. I'll never know what that's called. But um, And obviously the Good Brothers come out to help Kenny Omega to his feet. And he's like bleeding from the mouth. Um, fun little, you know, revenge to watch the Lucha Brothers get a little heat back on Kenny Omega and set up for the match next week. I like that. Uh, loved this kind of small payoff to the, the Young Bucks and Kenny Omega. I'm sure there will be more to come. Uh, I'm excited for the eventual Good Brothers versus the Young Bucks match. But I'm ready to get to this, you know, Ray Phoenix pack versus Kenny Omega and uh, not Kenny Omega, excuse me, the Young Bucks versus Ray Phoenix and pack for the uh, the AEW tag team titles. I'm like excited for that match. I'm just ready to get there already. But again, the anticipation is not a bad thing. The excitement is not a bad thing. Um, it's good to be excited for a feud and a rivalry. And I'm glad AEW is making me wait. Uh, and I also love that Laredo Kid was in this match and is going to be in next week's match too. Uh, obviously, not great that Pac is injured, um, as reported from the commentators, but uh, it makes it so, again, I'm, I'm more excited. There is less of a teaser, but also still enough to tease the the uh, the match between the Young Bucks and Pac and, and Phoenix. So glad that it's only Phoenix, though I have to say that the ending of this match was a little weird, the ending of the actual six-man tag team match to have... Um, uh, Laredo Kid get the pin on Cutler. It just seemed kind of anticlimactic, but I guess it was very non-committal to anything. If I were booking this, I would have had Ray Phoenix pin one of the Young Bucks again just to continue that heat. I, I think the Young Bucks can take another loss. I mean, Matt Jackson just took a loss. Uh, and then, uh, what's it called? Uh, I mean, Ray Phoenix has been on a roll, so I don't know. I just thought the finish to that six-man tag was a little bit weird, but I can't complain match of the night without a doubt fun to watch um and yeah and i'm sure we're going to talk about it a little later in one of the emails that i got um but so after that we had the jade cargill uh package i thought this was well done as well um i think better than just having another squash match you know back to back weeks um i'm excited about this rivalry between red velvet and jade cargill uh, I'm really excited to see, uh, hopefully, that she's gotten better in the ring. And, you know, Red Velvet is technically the number one seed uh, in the women's division, if, if I'm remembering correctly. So, yeah, great great feud between these two awesome women. Uh, great animosity. Just excited for the blow-off. Again, more just excitement, ready to get there. This, this whole show kind of seemed like a lot of just building and building and building, which is fine and functional, and it doesn't need to be awesome all the time. I mean, we did just get that awesome, you know, six-man tag match, so there was definitely some elite wrestling on the show, but just kind of seems to be a show of building, uh, which is awesome and which is fine, so. And then next up, we had a teaser for The Road to the Top, the upcoming reality show for Brandy and Cody Rhodes, and if you didn't see it coming, I don't know where you've been, because this is just perfect for The Rhodes brand. I, I'd expect nothing less, but this looked cute. Looked exciting. Uh, you know, I'm a huge Cody Rhodes fan. I told you guys my story of meeting him and Brandy at a random diner in my hometown uh, a couple couple years back, a, a bunch of years back, um, when he was still wrestling with uh, Gold Dust as a tag team in WWE before the whole Stardust fiasco. Wow, that was, a, those were, oh, that was bad. Anyways, um, 
so yeah, so I'm excited for this cute little reality show. I mean, I, I can't promise you guys I'm watching it or anything, but it looked cute and whatever. Uh, it, nice, just warm-hearted stuff for AEW. Not all blood and guts, you know. They're catering to a lot of a lot of people. They want to be a buffet. So, um, nevertheless, we move on to the John Moxley and Eddie Kingston segment. Um, Kingston has his leg in a cast. He's so funny. I mean, these two guys are just great. Uh, they address the Good Brothers. Uh, Eddie Kingston says some, you know, cool, you know, street stuff that I'm not even going to try to repeat. And then they say, how far are you willing to take this? Uh, Do you think you're willing to take this as far as we are? And then Moxley says, you know, he owes the Young Bucks one. He doesn't like owing anybody anything, but says that the Young Bucks, if you're going to be in the game, Bucks, you better be willing to get your hands dirty. So... All I'm saying is this whole Young Bucks, Kenny, uh, Omega, Good Brothers, Moxley, Kingston shenanigans is just exciting and fun to watch. And a great dynamic between, like, all these guys. Just a bunch of awesome matchups you can make between all this stuff. Similar to, like, how I talk about the pinnacle and the inner circle. Just leaves a whole bunch of opportunities to do all these kind of other matches that don't aren't necessarily the payoff match we're all thinking about. But are still super exciting. Just a brilliant way to book. Um, and yeah, I, I have nothing else other to say than that. Um, and then we move on to the women's match, uh, which was Nyla Rose with Vicky Guerrero versus Tay Conti. And uh, this is a rematch from the AEW Women's World Championship Eliminator Tournament where Nyla Rose went over on Tay Conti. Um, it was nice to see the Dark Order come out to the stage during Tay Conti's entrance and support her. And yeah, I mean, this is a match between the number two seed and the number three seed in the women's division. You would think this should probably be kind of a big deal, but it really wasn't treated that much. Um, yeah, I mean, this match wasn't great. It was it was fun to watch, though. I mean, uh, there were some cool spots. I mean, there was a spot where Conti hits Nyla with two bicycle kicks. She keeps going for the DD tie. Uh, but Nyla backdrops her way out of it. Uh, later on, she Nyla hits the beast, uh, attempts the beast bomb on Conti, but she escapes. Uh, hits a kick, then a running knee strike on the outside. I like that spot. That was nice and snug. Uh, a lot of N- Nyla's knees and strikes were nice and snug too. Um, Ty Conti looked more aggressive than usual tonight. Uh, last night for sure. Um, but yeah, I mean, the ending of this match was that she spikes Nyla with the DD tie and pins her. And uh, she climbs to the top rope to celebrate. But Vicky grabs her by the ankle and Nyla, Ra- Nyla Rose uh, tries to ambush her. Um, she goes for the beach, uh, the beach bomb. She goes for the beast bomb. But uh, Akara Shida runs out and makes the save. Hits Nyla with the kendo stick. And then... Somehow, the bunny storms to the ring, uh, and I feel like I'm reading a kid's book. The bunny comes next. No, the bunny storms to the ring, uh, grabs the kendo stick, and hits Karashita from behind. And then, of course, because we cannot have an AEW Dynamite show without him, Matt Hardy comes out with his company in tow and says that the AEW Women's World Championship Eliminator Tournament was a sham and crap because the bunny wasn't in it. And uh, that AEW is taking away opportunities from his clients or something along those lines. I don't know, guys. I kind of tuned out when Matt Hardy started talking. Um, So to wrap this whole thing up, the match was okay. Um, Again, definitely not all elite. Uh, I know a lot of these women have a lot more developing to do, but I'm sorry. You know, if you want to be on Dynamite, you got to be all elite, right? If this is supposed to be all elite wrestling. But a lot of the men weren't tonight either. So I think Nyla Rose is incredible. And I love Ty Conti. I think she is going to be a brilliant baby face. Uh, She already is, but I think she's got, you know, big time written all over her. Definitely future AEW Women's Champion. She, um, you know, just refines her craft a tiny bit more. Uh, I, I think she's awesome. I really think these two women are great and deserve to be in the spots that they're in. I, I just think, I don't know, this just didn't do it for me. I think there was, it was sloppy and slow in places, and you could kind of see like something that really throws me off, and maybe I'm just picky, guys. Maybe this match was great, and I'm just being snippy because this, this wasn't an amazing show. But um, And they have the women in the third hour once again. But, um, you know, when, like, one of the – uh, people are running to the rope and then you have the other person kind of like looking like already getting ready for the reversal that so-and-so is going to put on or like just little 
points in the match, I guess I just watched with a little bit more of a critical eye that, that take away the believability of it. So all in all, whatever this was supposed to do, I don't know if it was a success. If it was supposed to get Matt Hardy more airtime, then maybe it was a success. Ugh, and then we get more of him later on. Uh, I'm not, I don't mean to pick on Matt Hardy. It just, it's just give, give the women two matches on the card, I guess is what I'm trying to get to. Like you had this unbelievable main event, right? The probably the best match in AEW women's division history, uh, without a doubt, actually. Um, and one of the greatest women's matches in, in the U S at least. Um, and yeah, I mean, then this is how you follow up with it. You follow up with it with a singles match between Ty Conti and Nyla Rose. That's a little bit slow and sloppy and, uh, in the third hour. And this is the only women's match on the, on the card. Like you have other women on the roster, right? Like, Put them in a match, right? Like, I understand that the development of these women is a little bit slower, but, like, that's no excuse anymore, man. We've been in this pandemic for over a year now. Figure it out. You know, if you want to say that AEW's women's division is good now and complete, then you got to prove it. You've got how many men's matches on this card and how many freaking interviews were there? And how many times did we talk about Sting? Oh, my God. Put another women's match on the card. You can't just like rest on your laurels of last week and have this great main event and then follow it up with this crap. Sorry. I understand we had an interview from uh, Dr. Britt Baker. That doesn't count. Get two women's matches on the card for next week on AEW and, and try to elevate this women's division. I don't even care if the matches aren't amazing. Like uh, if the match is up to this standard, fine. If both matches are up to this standard, that's great. And I know there's one announced for uh, next week and we will probably preview next week's show at the end of this show. Um, with the matches that have been announced, but I don't know, guys. I'm just, I am annoyed with AEW and its inability to to follow up on this awesome main event from last week and all this momentum they were riding for the women, and then this is what they come up with, a third-hour singles women's match, and then a whole weird thing with Matt Hardy at the end of it and the bunny. It just didn't make sense. Um, like, cool, you prepared for next week's match, but what what after that? And maybe they have some great grand plan for the bunny that I just don't know about. But I don't know. I, I don't. I also didn't need to see any men. I, I, like not to sound like feminist or anything like that. But I just didn't. I didn't need to see Matt Hardy. Maybe just have the bunny come out. Give the mic to the bunny. Let's see what she can do. Let's see what the bunny can do on AEW. I can't believe I'm saying that. Anyways, I'm not going to rant about the women anymore, guys. You probably know just as well as I do. But, um... I will say Nyla Rose in this match wrestled like a brilliant heel and that's that's the best she could probably do. Um just the little things like imitating um Ty Conti's dance on the outside of the ring and the the viciousness of her submissions and the way she takes her time to taunt and the cocky covers and whatever. Uh, you know, that that was good, but I I just don't think this was all elite and I think the women deserve way more than what they're getting on AEW and you know, like I said, guys, Britt Baker has proved to be a draw uh, for ratings. And the women's match last week was, you know, probably one of the most talked about matches in AEW in a while. And terrible, terrible follow up, in my opinion. Um, would have loved to see more. I expect more from the booking. Um, just sad, you know, I, I think as bad as the women's divisions are in WWE right now or as as confuzzled as that SmackDown main event picture is with Bianca Belair and Reginald and it just and the Raw what what is the Raw women's division and the so called tag team division. I mean NXT is NXT so I'm not even gonna go there. But this is if you wanna try to even begin to compare to any of that, you gotta put more women's matches on the show. And I think I proved my point. So I am gonna move back um, or move on, you know, like I said, I think Ty Conti is great. I don't mean to put her down. I think she had a great energy in the match and a good comeback. And, um, some of the execution was slow, but the overall finish of the match, the DD tie, uh, was great and whatever. I don't know, guys, I'm, I'm just tired of seeing the, the women get this kind of treatment on AEW, but, uh, yeah, so so moving on now from from that, don't worry, we'll get more Matt Hardy for you guys later on. Um, we move on to something that's even worse than the women's division, debatably, and that is the Kip Sabian Miro best friends promo. 
uh, for the match next week. It's going to be an arcade anarchy. <sighs> there were a couple lines in this I did like, though. Uh, Chuck calls Miro Donkey Kong looking bleep, a uh, word that I'm not allowed to say on the show. And then Orange Cassidy calls Kip uh, Donkey Kong Jr. And Chuck's like, oh, okay, that that, that works. It was cute. Um, and then Miro calls Orange Cassidy a walking Xanax again. I think that's funny. Um, but this whole thing, I'm sorry, guys. Funny nicknames and cute little one-liners don't make up for a good story and good heat and a good rivalry. And I'm so bored of this, and I don't care about this match next week. This is going to have to blow me away for me to actually give a crap about any of this. Um and then they announce the matches for next week after that, um, and we will get into that at the end of the show because I do want to do a quick little preview because AEW actually makes its matches beforehand, so I, I can do something like that. Um, next, we had the Scorpio Sky promo. I don't know, guys. This Maybe I'm just in a bad mood at this point, but this kind of uh, just felt like an advertisement for Dark Elevation uh, with his Mike Seidel match on Monday. And um, the heel turn kind of feels dead now because he wasn't really followed up with on dynamite this week so whatever the great talent in scorpio sky should probably follow up if you're going to do something with him um and last but not least guys we had the main event uh tnt championship match it was john silver versus darby allen uh I mean, first and foremost, I think I've said it on this show before, too, and if I haven't, I, I should, that that TNT title is beautiful. I like the TNT title more than I like the world title. I think it's just pretty and nice to look at, and, and I'm sure uh, it blows the original TNT belt. Remember when that was that little red and silver thing uh, when Lance Archer and Cody had the uh, first TNT championship match? You know, this is obviously an, an improvement, and it's such a beautiful title. Um, small thing, but I just wanted to say that. Uh, so they start the match out. Uh, Darby Allen gives a quick homage to uh, Brody Lee, obviously. And, um, you know, Darby starts by using his amateur wrestling background. He seems to really have been showcasing in the last couple uh in his last couple of matches. But honestly, guys, for the most part, Silver had, you know, control in this match. Um and uh, had a really great showcase. I mean, uh, rolls Darby with a slam into the turnbuckle and then a brain buster. But uh, Darby kicks out of the pin. Uh, on the outside of the ring, he hits Darby, uh, but Darby dodges it. He goes over the barricade. Um, Dark Order move and surround Darby Allen until Sting comes out. Because, of course, Sting! Like, God, it, I think it was Tony Schiavone sounds like Michael Cole when Sasha Banks comes out. Like, the boss or the big dog. It sounds like he's very, very happy with himself. Let me put it that way. Sting! Like, I'm so sick of it, guys. Why is he just on the outside of the ring in this match? Like, the Dark Order didn't do anything to Darby Allen. They didn't touch him. I'm so sick of seeing Sting. This is not about Sting. This is not about some nostalgia act. This is all elite wrestling, and I want to see Darby Allen and John Silver have a great match. I don't want to be distracted by Sting with a baseball bat in the outside. Sorry. Just so sick of it, guys. I'm so sick of Sting. Um, John Silver comes back in the ring, hits Darby Allen with a bunch of kicks, uh, applies Anna Jay's Kingslayer. That was cool. Um, but uh, Darby Allen escapes. John Silver hits Darby Allen with a DDT, another kick out. Uh, Darby rolls to the outside, and Sting uh, threatens the Dark Order with his bat. I don't care, guys. Uh, John Silver kicks Darby Allen in the chest and stares at Sting uh, just to be like, "I don't, not scared by you." I, I, again, I don't know, guys. I'm, I hate that I have to recap Sting in this match. Uh, John Silver kicks Darby Allen a bunch more. These kicks sounded great, by the way. Um, later on, John Silver throws Darby Allen off the top rope and goes for the cover, but Darby Allen gets his feet on the rope. It was a weird, weird pinfall, not kick out, but weird pinfall rope break. I don't know. And I, I actually don't know if this was before or after that, but the weird spot in the match where Darby Allen's on the rope and John Silver's like laying down ready to, like, be hit, you know, with the coffin drop, and instead, just Darby Allen jumps to the outside and hits the Dark Order with it. Make absolutely no sense. You could have won the match right there, and instead you tend to do something else stupid. I, I don't know if it's just supposed to make Darby Allen look more like a daredevil, but I just, again, it made no sense to me. 
Nevertheless, though, Darby Allen later on hits the code red and pins John Silver for the three count. I mean, it seems like Darby Allen just seems to be scraping by in these TNT Championship title matches. I, I'm not, I'm not behind Darby Allen. I was behind John Silver, and by the end of the match, I was really wanting John Silver to win because I don't care about Sting around this TNT. If you want to have, let me put it this way: if you want to have Darby Allen and Sting do their thing, move the title away from it and have them do their thing on a different segment in the show, and put the TNT title on someone who's actually gonna focus on the TNT title and not some WCW nostalgia act throwing it out there um after the match Darby Allen and Sting shake hands um or or fist bump or whatever and then out of nowhere thank god to come to save the day it's Matt Hardy again uh jumps the barricade uh grabs Darby Allen throws him attacks Darby Allen all hell breaks loose brawl private party the butcher the blade Darby, Sting, Dark Order, whatever. I don't care, guys. Sorry. Uh, Matt Hardy, I don't care. But I'm, I feel bad to pick on Matt Hardy, but I just don't, I don't care. And I really understand he's trying. I just, I don't want to see Matt Hardy really wrestle anymore unless it's in a tag team match, maybe. But it's, he's just, he's not all elite anymore, guys. And, and I feel like he's getting shoved down my throat. And maybe that's why I feel that. Maybe if he was on less or I saw less of Matt Hardy, I'd want to see him more. Uh, I kind of like Hangman, right? We have Hangman on Dynamite every week, right? This week, I don't think he was on for more than a accumulative two minutes max. Maybe one minute max. That match did not, not one minute, That may, two, three minutes max. In a match, by the way, that was fun to watch. So maybe it's a little bit different. But my point being is I want to see more of Hangman Page. Like, I, I talked to you guys about all this building and all this excitement around all these other matches, and then there's this crap. And this is the end of the show? Are you kidding me? I mean, this TNT title match was good, despite all the shenanigans with Sting and, and even a little bit the Dark Order. I don't know. I don't think this deserved to be the main event. I think that six-man tag did, and um, and I didn't care about this. So I don't really have a lot of analysis. I'm, so, I hope, I'm sorry to bore you guys with that, but that's what I have to say about this. Um, less Sting, less Matt Hardy, more actual focusing on the championship and not all this outside nostalgia act break out into a brawl and cut to black and you'll have to tune in next week. Like, or tune in on Elevation. I don't, uh, you don't have to hook me. You can hook me with good storylines, AEW. You're not WWE. You know how to write good storylines. I'm hooked by good storylines. You don't need to do all this crap. Like, it's just so unnecessary, in my opinion, but whatever. Anyways, guys, we have one email, uh, and I want to get to that, and then I will do a quick preview of next week's show, because we have a couple matches announced, and I do I do want to talk about that. Um, I, I feel like I should call this email segment of the show just the, the DJ Kuzma segment, because... Thank you, DJ, for emailing again. I always love to hear your thoughts. You guys can email me. You know the deal. It's podcast at gmail.com. So it's podcast at gmail.com. If you've got thoughts on your AEW stuff, I'll try to get you on the show. You will more than likely get on the show. And, uh, and if it's about anything else, I'll probably talk about it on Sunday on my Highs and Lows show or Saturday night. So... Yes, please email me your thoughts whenever. Um, and uh, DJ emailed me uh, about AEW this week and said, Hey Mimi, DJ Kuzma here. Just mentioning some quick responses to the show as of March 24th. Firstly, in my opinion, nothing against the TNT title match between John Silver and Darby Allen, but the Young Bucks and Brian Cutler versus the Lucha Brothers should have been the main event of T- uh, of should have been the main event instead of the TNT title match. DJ, we are on the same wavelength. It's like you literally are listening to my podcast as I'm saying it because I just said that. Couldn't agree more. This was weird. Um, I do have something against the TNT title match, by the way, if you didn't hear, though. So I disagree with that. This, all this crap on the outside, I just didn't need the distractions. Um, and I would love to see Darby Allen actually look like a champion and not look like a little kid who manages to just beat all these guys just barely and can take a lot of punishment. Like, I understand he's small and, like, his it's his thing that he's a daredevil, but I don't know, man. Like, that match with, um, I'm so blanking, uh, on the name. It was a couple weeks ago, before Scorpio Sky, the, the title match before Scorpio Sky, uh, the Madman, uh, 
oh my god, I can't remember the name and I'm just not going to even bother looking it up. So one of you email me, please, because anyways, we thought this was going to be like a big, you know, hot shot, high flying, just high spot after high spot match. And Darby Allen showed you that he could really grapple and wrestle. Like, that was fun to watch. I don't need to see like a squash match and then Darby Allen hit the code red and that be a title defense. It just doesn't scream champion to me, but... Um, DJ, you continue to say the Lucha Brothers match against the Young Bucks was an awesome match that I would watch over and over. So many high-octane spots, and Laredo Kid looked great in his return. Hope to see more of the Lucha Brothers since it seems like Pac is probably going to be out for some time. Yeah, I don't know a lot about what the deal with Pac is, but hopefully uh, not too long, and hopefully we get that tag team title match, and I'm sure if they had some plan with that, they will... AEW will land on its feet, and uh, I mean, I don't know, the Young Bucks have enough stuff going on, so I'm sure that can wait. Uh, Secondly, I'm interested to see what happens next with the Young Bucks, Kenny Omega, Bullet Club storyline angle, because it seems like the Young Bucks are no longer allies of Kenny and the Good Brothers. Yeah, I I agree, DJ, I'm super interested in that too. Like I said, the Young Bucks have enough stuff going on right now. Just more things to look forward to next week that we don't have to end the show in a brawl to get me there. Uh, thirdly, I didn't expect Ty Conte to win the match against Nyla Rose. I really thought it was going to be a squash match uh, victory for Nyla. Well, I think, like I said, I think Ty Conte is n- ranked number two and Nyla is number three. And I thought this was a great showing for Ty Conte to Ty Conte. That's hard for me to say. I don't know why. Um, overall, I thought it was a great showing. Even if the match wasn't great, it was still good to see her get some spotlight, even if it was in the third hour of the show. But... It was still nice to see, and I and I thought she looked better than she did before, and she seems to continuously be getting better, so at least there is that. Never once did I believe that Matt, Matt Seidel was going to pin Kenny Omega, but he did put up a good fight against Kenny in the loss. Uh, I agree. I was with you. It was just kind of a fun match. Maybe like a lesser version of the Ray Phoenix Kenny Omega actual title defense. Just fun to watch, but you kind of know what the outcome was going to be. I know AEW gets... um a bad rap for being super predictable a lot of the time, but I don't always think predictable is bad. Um, though it is nice to have a not like something that isn't predictable going on too, i.e. the whole pinnacle thing. So that was cool. But um, yeah, good match. Um, finally, I don't get why Sting needed to be at ringside during the main event match. And I think since his debut, Sting has been on every AE Dynamite show. That's all for now. Best regards. DJ, you get me. I'm so sick of it, man. I cannot talk any more about Sting. I will give him no more airtime on this podcast because he gets enough of it on Dynamite. It's just, you stop hot shotting the. I feel like I'm watching a WWE show the way I'm talking about some of this stuff, guys. No, I won't even go that far. It's not that bad. But you know what I'm saying. I'm just, the, the way the quote unquote legends are being used, like Britt Baker said it best, man. It's right under your nose, Tony Khan. Put two women's matches on the show next week. Stop putting Sting on the show. Stop putting Matt Hardy in every segment. Stop mentioning Sting in every match. I'm just, stop it. Sick of it. Um, anyways, thank you for the email, DJ. Nice to hear from you as always. You guys can email me. You heard it before. Mimi.realwwepodcast.com. I'm doing things with my hands. I don't know why I'm doing a podcast. You guys can't see me. Thank God. All right, and quickly to end this wonderful, weird podcast that we've had tonight, guys, um, I want to do a quick preview of next week's show. Like we said, we had the uh, Arcade Anarchy match uh, announced, and uh, it's going to be Kip Sabian and Miro versus Best Friends, uh, Chuck and Orange Cassidy. (sighs) I want to insert that, like, don't care little vine into this or TikTok or whatever that sound effect is. I, I I, I don't care. Um... I, like I said, this is going to be have to be really good for me to actually care. Um, what I'd really like to see in this match, guys, is Miro kick a bunch of butt, Kip Sabian take the loss, and then Miro be like, why am I hanging out with this loser? And then, you know, maul Kip Sabian, and Kip Sabian will land on his feet somewhere because I do, I have a lot, I, I like Kip Sabian a lot. Um, I just think this stinks and uh, needs to end. Um, and then we've got Cody versus QT. Marshall, uh, and the special guest referee is Arn Anderson. Guys, I have no idea what this is all about, why it's called an exhibition match, and I'm just blanking on what this is supposed to mean, maybe. I I don't know. We'll have to see how this thing goes. I have no preview for that. We're doing really well on the first previewing we're ever doing on this show, huh? 
Um, we got Kenny Omega versus or Kenny Omega and the Good Brothers versus uh, Lucha Brothers and the Laredo Kid. I, just Laredo Kid, not the Laredo Kid. Um, excited for this match. This should be great. Obviously, a great follow up to what happened tonight. Um, and it's Kenny Omega and the Good Brothers versus the Lucha Bros and the Laredo Kid. Like you're, I expect another banger. I honestly don't expect it to be good as this week's match. I just think. Uh, the dynamic between the Young Bucks and the Lucha Bros were probably going to be better than the Good Brothers is, but it'll be nice to see the clash of styles of the Good Brothers and the Lucha Bros and Laredo Kids. So, and then last, uh, not last, we have what did I miss? We have uh, Hikaru Shida and Tay Conti. Tay Conti. Tay Conti. Hikaru Shida and Tay Conti versus the Bunny and Nyla Rose. It's a women's match, guys, and it's a follow-up, so cool. Uh, I expect Hikaru Shida and Teikanti to win this one because she's the champion, but you never know. Maybe we set up for another championship match against Hikaru Shida. I'm just glad to see Hikaru Shida wrestling on uh, on Dynamite. I'd love to see her have a singles match on Dynamite, honestly. I can't remember the last time we saw that, so... And then, last but not least, we have Christian will make his AEW Dynamite debut debut against Frankie Kazarian. I don't know, guys. He's got a lot of pressure on him to perform. This match has got to be, I don't think it has got to be five-star, but it, it's just got to be something worth talking about. Um, and we will do just that next week on this AEW Dynamite review show here on the unofficial WWE podcast. Thank you guys for listening. Um, really appreciate it. Always love hearing from you. Uh, so send me an email if you want to send in your thoughts about AEW. Overall, exciting parts of the show. Some not so exciting parts of the show. Really a, a good a good passable week, I would say, in, in the booking to continue on a bunch of storylines or further develop things going on, character development and all that stuff. But I think, like I said, my biggest complaint is what a letdown on the follow-up from the women's match last week. Just poorly done. Not not a fan. Let's see if they can do better next week. I mean, they've got one match already on the card. Let's hopefully they put on another. Um, and that's not the only solution, obviously, guys. I mean, they need to continue to build the storylines. Let's see something new with Red Velvet and Jade Cargill. Maybe a promo from one of them tomorrow. Not tomorrow, gosh. Maybe a promo from one of them, even if it's on Elevation or um, Dark. At least it's a start. And we get uh, moving on with another women's feud that you can showcase on Dynamite. So... That's it for me, guys. The only other last thing I want to mention is it sounds like AEW is doing its first house show ever on, I think it was April 7th, I want to say. I know it was WrestleMania week, uh, and I think it was April 7th. So that's cool, first house show. I don't I don't know what they're going to do, if they're going to, you know, tape it at all, or if it's just going to be, you know, all just live show, no TV, no YouTube, no anything. But exciting for AEW, glad to see things slowly getting back to normal or whatever normal looks like and uh and yeah and that is officially it i hope you all have a wonderful rest of your week i hope to see you or hear you guys or i I don't hear you guys because this is a podcast but uh i have a highs and lows show on sunday so i'll see you then and uh if i don't i'll see you next week on the aew dynamite review show where we will hopefully be a little bit higher on the women's division and uh, have some more developments in all these wonderful storylines going on in AEW. And maybe we won't have to rant about Sting this week, guys. Next week. Maybe we won't have to rant about Sting next week. That would be great for you and me. Uh, Have a great rest of your day and uh, see you next time.